August 28th, 1990. A massive man squeezed out of his Bentley, accompanied by his athletic friend. They made an unusual pair, one a fitness enthusiast, the other a hefty figure of over 20 stone. Their bond extended beyond business. They were linked by their partners, who were sisters. In the early hours of Tuesday morning, after a busy bank holiday, the king of the hot dog vans and his companion were eager for some well-deserved rest, their pockets lined with profits. But just as they reached for their keys, two masked figures emerged from the shadows. A tense exchange of angry words ensued, and in a heartbeat, the night turned deadly. One of the masked men drew a gun and without hesitation shot both men in cold blood. I followed this case at the time in my local newspaper, The Sentinel, that reported on the case daily in Stoke-on-Trent. A detail in a person largely forgotten about is that of one of the victims, John Weston, who worked for hot dog tycoon Gary Thompson and was also partners with Gary Thompson's wife Mavis's sister. John was from Stoke-on-Trent, but had been staying with his friend and boss in Leicestershire and was sadly killed alongside Thompson in horrific circumstances. John was a very popular man, only 28 at the time, with his whole life ahead of him. A keen sportsman and cricketer, he had a young son of three who lost his father that fateful morning. Gary Thompson, on the other hand, was a big man at 20 stone plus and had two children, Rebecca and Craig, from his wife Mavis. He was a very successful as a mobile fast food operator with over 100 vans with plots all over the country, including huge events like the Grand National and music festivals. The industry is a cutthroat one, where only the strongest and most ruthless survived, and Thompson allegedly ruled his business with an iron rod. Thompson built his business up in Stoke-on-Trent, originally landing in the Potteries in 1976, where he worked night and day at his first base at Bourne's Bank, Burslem, where he founded the American Hot Dog Company. Later he switched his business to the Newfield Industrial Estate in Sandyford, where he also bought a house. In 1983, Gary sold his catering rights and his house to his friend Nick Rowley and set his sights on more lucrative deals in the Midlands. Nick told the Staffordshire Sentinel after his friend's death, It's a very competitive business, and Gary undoubtedly upset a lot of people on his way up, but he worked for every penny he ever got, and people were only envious of him because of what he achieved. Ex-burger trader Tony Tracy said of the fast food king, his secret was he had a knack for making money and would work 24 hours a day if he had to. Tracy of Golden Hill Stoke went on to say, he was a very hard man and had an aggressive attitude and made en enemies in the trade. He took a lot of work off established firms by paying top prices for a franchise. Another former employee of Thompson, Darren Johnson, spoke to the Daily Mirror shortly after his death, saying, we were worked like slaves. We were bullied and shouted at and paid only £25 for two days' work. All the lads were on the dole, so there was nothing we could do. I had a row with him and he smashed me in the face with his mobile phone. Despite Thompson's dubious business practices, which would be frowned upon at best, he was very successful and at the relatively young age of 32, had established a business that turned over millions. According to news and court reports, Gary and the smaller Weston got out of Thompson's Bentley at around 2am Tuesday morning, August 28th, after a busy bank holiday weekend, with cash between 30 to 70k, depending on which reports you read. Two men, one described around a similar size to Thompson, and another man around six foot, came out of the shadows in masks and shouted out to the two men. Thompson and Weston allegedly had a brief argument with the two shadowy figures before they were shot in the legs and then finished off with another volley of shots whilst writhing in agony on the floor. Thompson died immediately and Weston was fatally wounded, but he died later in hospital. The money was stolen and the men sped off in a vehicle. This disturbing act of violence quite rightly made headline news in Leicester and Stoke-on-Trent, with the public and families and friends of the men demanding swift action from the police. Witnesses were slow coming forward, with people fearful of getting involved in the aftermath 
with whispers of a hot dog war during the rounds and the potential involvement of a former gangster, Ramsey Kacicic, who recently went on a Sean Atwood podcast and denied any knowledge of the brutal killings. You were accused of being involved in hot dog murders. What was that about? There was um, a guy that, that did hot dog concessions. His name, his name was Gary. Um, he used to supply, you know, you know, uh, mobile food things, uh, concessions to the, the great big uh, music festivals and things. So he, you know, he could take 100, 150,000 pounds in a weekend. Wow. Which was all cash. Nice. And, and he was robbed. <clears throat> uh, and what happened, one of the people involved shot two of them, sort of just executed two them. You know, I don't, it wasn't, I don't think it was necessary. But um, when it happened, the, the, guys, the guys eventually got nicked for it, actually used to work for me. Well, they did work for me. One of them used to work for me, sort of on and off, and, and the other two did. So I, when it happened, somebody came up to me and said, the police visited me, you know, so, and they reckon that you, you killed that, that guy, hot dog man. You killed him. It's like, what, so that I killed him? I said, yeah, they're, they're telling everyone that they're interviewing that you, you did it. So we ended up all getting arrested twice. And then I got, I, there's no charges on me because the, first of all, I, I did it. Then they wanted to say I arranged it. Then they want to say I supplied the gun, and then they said I supplied the packed lunch. You know, it was you just kept going down and down. You must have supplied something. Conspiracy. Yeah, you know the conspiracy thing. Yeah, and um, the guys got done for it. And but the guy that was the driver, he went QE against them, and I, I it all got embroiled in that. What happened was there was a guy called, and I'll name this prick. His name is. He was a police informer. And if anyone fucking wants to contradict that, I've got his fucking interview tapes, you know, at home. So he's he's a fucking grass. He decided to become agent provocateur with the police to try to rile me into saying something that could probably get me in trouble. And this went on for ages. He's ringing the house and he put the, there was posters for the murders that they were pointing out, so uh, who, you know, does anyone know what's, you know, who murdered this guy? And he doctored them and just put Ramsey Catchy, uh, killed Gary Thompson and, they, and and put them up all over the place. Um, and it, I think what it was, he, he should have been with Gary that night and he thought he got in his twist because he was on drugs and everything. He got, he decided in his own mind and he, he also did, was a hot dog man as well. That, I, that, that it was a hit on him and and this this Gary, and um, he, he just got that into his head, and he thought if he made enough noise around it, I won't be able to get him because he thought I were going to get him. But he, I mean, he, I did terrorise him a bit because, I, but I didn't do anything about it because he didn't scare me. I knew he wasn't a danger to me, in you know, as a person. Otherwise, I would have had to have done something about it. But I mean, he made some serious threats and. You know, yeah. The police said that there were people wanted to, you know, kill me and stuff. And mm. but you, but you did end up getting busted. Warren Slaney was a promising professional boxer from Leicester, and according to his former boss, the aforementioned Ramsey, he worked for him for a period as a bouncer alongside his co-accused. All these men were arrested at the time for questioning, but it was Warren Slaney and Terence Burke a fellow bouncer who worked for Ramsey and the alleged driver, Andrew Robinson, who were arrested and remanded into custody for over a year until the start of their trial at Northampton Crown Court, Wednesday 12th of Feb. The prosecution team, led by QC Anthony Palmer, set their case out, which flagged up a significant point to me straight away. The QC claimed that Terence Burt was Warren Slaney's right-hand man for the robbery and the victims had been, I quote, ruthlessly shot down in gangster style. He said the two were returning late from working at a depot in Aylstone Road, Leicester, where Thompson's Catering Empire was based. Mr. Weston and his girlfriend 
had been living with Mr Thompson and his wife at their home. The pair were carrying takings from hot dog vans, which had been busy over the bank holiday. QC Palmer said Mr Thompson's wife Mavis was dozing in the lounge with her sister, Mr Weston's girlfriend, waiting for the two men. Mrs Thompson awoke to hear a disturbance outside. She allegedly saw a fight between her husband and Terence Burke and rang the police. She heard a shot whilst on the phone, then a car driving off. This was reported by the Sentinel after day one of the court case, Wednesday, February 12th, 1992. It is interesting to note there was no mention of Slaney being recognised, only Terence Burke. In fact, the two men who Thompson was fighting with were both described as big and over six foot tall, where Warren Sloney at the time was around five foot eight and thin, ten stone. Completely different sizes. The prosecution framing of the case would go on for around a week, focusing on three key witnesses. Their whole case relies solely on witness statements as they had no physical evidence linking Slaney to the killings. No blood, no DNA, nada, zilch. Just the three witnesses who were involved in the murder. Two of the main witnesses were one Andrew Robinson, the driver who was allegedly paid a thousand to drive the shooters to Thompson. Robinson claimed in court that security boss Ramsey Kacic was a big Mr. Big behind the plot and he had hired Slaney and Burke to steal the takings. He stated he never knew there would be any killing and thought Thompson was in on the robbery for an insurance job. The prosecution's whole case was based on the girlfriend of Terence Burke and the person Terence hired as a driver. Amazingly, there was no eyewitness from the wife who saw the attackers. She described them as over six foot and big, unlike, as I've already said, the short and slim Warren Slaney. Despite police searches, no forensic evidence could be found at all. The defence of Warren Slaney had only a few days to put nine witnesses forward who had all seen Warren at the time of the killings at his auntie's house who was holding a party. It was alleged by the defence that the witness statements from Burke and his girlfriend and the driver were false and concocted as they were under pressure by the Mr Big who had orchestrated the robbery to lay the blame at Slaney's feet at the same time getting themselves off. The only stumbling block for Warren Slaney's defence as I could see it in the reports was that at the time of him first being pulled in he allegedly told the police that being at his mum's house the night of the killing, not his auntie's. But this, I believe, if true, was just a confusion of the date, which would not have been a significant date to Slaney if he were not involved in it. It's quite easy to make these little mistakes over dates. Apart from this one discrepancy, as I've said, there was only the evidence of the two men involved in the killing and the driver's girlfriend, who I won't mention her name. Despite this, Warren Slaney was sentenced to a life sentence with a 20-year recommendation. Fast forward 34 years, Warren has done 14 years over his recommended tariff as he will not bow down and buckle and admit to a crime he says he did not commit. Character that people were, I'm not saying he's guilty, I'm just reporting on what was said in the court case that initially this guy that they worked for in the door, they thought he may be involved. I don't know whether he was or not. He says he wasn't. You saw the snippet from Sean Atwood's podcast with him denying any involvement or knowledge. However, there are significant grounds for this to be reopened. And as well as there not been any, um, any evidence at all, which was forensic that they could find, and there'd be nine witnesses saying that he was at his auntie's party. The fact that he has consistently fought against this and denied it for 14 years over his tariff says everything I need to know as well. The case was flimsy weak, concocted by two people who were heavily involved and Bert got sentenced as well for it. Um, for the murder you know he was involved in it and he's tried to lay the blame at Warren Slaney's door in my opinion okay and he's got the driver and his, the driver's girlfriend involved 
in this little conspiracy. Was there a bit Mr. Big behind it or was it just their idea? I don't know. Um, like I say, this is my opinion. But I've gone through everything, all the court records and news archives. This guy's innocent. I don't know if Warren Slane's a nice guy. There's all sorts of stories that he's a hard man in prison, he's battered loads of people and this, that and the other. Well, I'm not surprised if that's true. I don't know if it's true or not. Because if I'd been put in prison for a life sentence that I hadn't done, I'd have the raving hump constant because you wouldn't want to be there every day being told what to do. Strip searches, solitary confinement, your family put through hell trying to come and visit you, knowing that you're innocent of the crime and that your life's just been thrown down. You know, a young man's life has just been snatched away from him. And then you've got all the politics in prison concrete jungle, whatever you want to call it, especially in the dispersal uh, prisons, where there's lots of very, very dangerous characters. And of course, Warren was a boxer, so he's going to be able to handle himself. Um, and also, combining that, he's got a huge, heavy weight line on him that he's innocent in prison for something that he hadn't done. I completely believe he's innocent, this has to be put forward. We've got a new government now. I beg everyone now to share this video, support the campaign, and let's try and get as much movement on this as we can. Obviously, the family are working tirelessly, and the friends and the team behind it who've done all the heavy lifting and work. I'm just contributing here on my channel where I can. But of course, if anyone wants to know any further information, I shall leave links to the YouTube channel that's been set up, any more relevant information. And um, if you've got any questions, please let me know in the comments. I'm happy to answer them. Okay, but just to reiterate, I believe he's innocent. I wanted to give some detail about the two victims in this crime which weren't, I believe, commit, uh, committed by Warren Slaney, as they need justice too, and their families need real justice, because I believe they haven't had that yet. I know this must be very emotionally draining and terrible for them to, to have to go through again, but if the, right, if the wrong person is in prison for that crime, then or one of the wrong people, that doesn't make things better. But I did want to touch on give them a bit of a human because a lot of times it's just hot dog wars but I want, you know, there was two people there with families who were just gunned down you know, and we, we shouldn't forget that either okay, that's me done take care